Namaste and good morning, friends. My name is Sangeeta Menon. Welcome to all the participants of the 23rd NIAS course for Senior Executives on Excellence and Leadership. A very warm welcome to all of you, to this institute, and to Bangalore. The course for Senior Executives on Excellence and Leadership is the flagship course of the institute, and it goes back, back to the history of almost the inception of this institute. And it is very much connected with JRD Tata's vision about the interaction between a multidisciplinary institute like this and eminent leaders like you. This morning, we have Mr. Mohandas Pai to give the inaugural lecture. And before that, let me request our director, Dr. K. Kasturi Rankan, to say a few opening remarks and welcome Mr. Pai. Good morning, uh, Mr. Mohan Das Pai, Professor B.B. Srikantan, esteemed participants to this course, Pro Professor Sangeeta Menon, Professor Shetty, my all other colleagues from NIAS, ladies and gentlemen. It gives me great pleasure to welcome all of you to this flagship course, as Sangeeta Menon said, of this National Institute of Advanced Studies. This is the 23rd of the series that has been taking place over the last more than two decades. And of course, the title is, and the, the theme is, the excellence in leadership. At the very outset, I would like to thank all of you individually uh, for making it possible for attending this course. I know all of you are at senior level. You have your own commitments in your respective places of work but that you took time off for a week to be with us for this course, we really very much appreciate. And also, we appreciate the sponsoring agencies which made this possible for all of you. This institute, the NIAS, is the realization of a very old dream. In the first decade of the last century, when Jamshed Ji Tata was negotiating with the then British Indian government and the princely state of Mysore to set up Indian Institute of Science, and incidentally that celebrates its 100th year this year, and the, he felt the need for the inclusion of some of the subjects that usually go under the name of humanities. Science and technology, after all, does not exist in isolation from the rest of society. And these barriers between technology and the social sciences has been breaking down even more rapidly in the recent decade. But I should mention that the Indian Institute of Science itself didn't adopt this dream of Jamshed Ji Tata. Speaking from my own personal experience, I should say, because I come from the Department of Space earlier, and uh, there is an organization whose underlying objective is to bring the benefits of the science and technology uh, to the grassroots level development of this country. The systems that we have built up on, over the years and the type of money that we have expended certainly can be justified, not purely in terms of our ability to develop the technology but and engineering products, but more importantly with respect to its relevance in the context of socio-economic development. If you look at the use of remote sensing system, India probably has one of the most extensive application program in the context of remote sensing. Again, if you look at the communication besides, of course, and broadcasting, besides all those entertainment broadcasting, you have a large chunk of uh, programs which are related to education, related to health, and so on. And of course, communication, I don't have to emphasize, this provides for the first time in the last 15 years connectivity to several locations in the country which otherwise for geographical reasons has not been reachable uh, for, uh, for de decades. So this system today is one of the very critical element of India's development and also demonstrates the importance of science and technology in the context of socio-economic development. It is no surprise then that when J.R.D. Tata inherited this dream, he worked toward developing it into a larger vision. And in fact, this institute really came into being by the vision of J.R.D. Tata. 
a very illustrious successor of Jamshedji Tata. He saw in the National Institute of Advanced Studies an opportunity to enable people in different fields and in diverse activities to both update their knowledge and also interact with each other. My distinguished predecessors, Dr. Raja Ramanna, who was the founder director of this institute, and his equally illustrious successor, Dr. Rodam Narsimha, provided a concrete shape to this vision. Of course, it was not an easy vision to bring in multidisciplinarity to a research, bring people who are in different areas or different themes of expertise to come together, and those, two, those, and those also, some of the best minds who have to be brought in, uh, it has to be really experienced to understand the intricacies and complexities of such a step. Over the last two decades of its existence, National Institute of Advanced Studies has translated JRD's vision into at least three distinct initiatives. First, it has defined a clear direction in which it would like to take advantage, to, to take knowledge forward. In keeping with its purpose of bringing people from different specializations together in the pursuit of knowledge, the Institute undertakes multidisciplinary research in the natural sciences, social sciences, technology, humanities, and the arts to help understand the complex issues facing the Indian and global society. This approach has seen the three schools of NIAS cover a very wide range of issues from signal and image processing to the sociological conditions of IT professionals in India and the Netherlands to the missile capability of China and Pakistan. The wide range of expertise that has been developed to pursue such diverse interest has increased the scope of, for genuine multidisciplinary approaches to uh, issues. The second major thrust that has been to act as a think tank to public and private institutions. This has involved interacting with the government at a number of levels. NIAS reports have been known to provide valuable inputs into the policy making at both the center and the states. As an institution too, NIAS has been directly involved in state initiatives like the District Quality Education Program. There has also been collaboration with leading international organizations like Global Water Partnership. The expertise of individual NIAS faculty has also been tapped by the governments, both at the state and the center level, in addition. NIAS initiatives being in the areas of immediate concern, they have attracted the attention of several civil society organizations. The third significant direction that NIAS has started out for itself is in some sense also the most ambitious. NIAS aims to contribute significantly to the creation of a new leadership in all sections of society. Some of the contribution is through the publications of the NIAS faculty. The development of ideas and their publication should help bridge some of the knowledge gaps that ideas and the leaders face in the rapidly changing world. But NIAS hopes to contribute to the development of leadership also through means that go beyond the passive generation of knowledge. In the effort to encourage dialogue, it has not hesitated to bring together adversaries in some of the country's the most intractable conflicts. In a recent initiative, the Institute provided a platform for a series of consultations between the different states, sites in the Kaveri River water dispute. It also organizes public lectures that present some of the leading minds in the world to the city of Bangalore. We at the National Institute of Advanced Studies are also acutely aware that leadership is about looking beyond the walls built by narrow specialization. Our multidisciplinary approach to issues ensures that specialists in one discipline can look at other sciences. But this is not enough. We recognize that the specializations are not confined to research interests alone. They extend to different walks of life. A civil servant's worldview is not quite that of an academic, and both look at the world very differently from one of the leading lights of business, from the one who is a leading light in the business. 
It has been our effort, therefore, to bring together exceptionally gifted and able persons from the different streams of national life, whether it is the civil services, business and industry, academia or from other professions. In the process, we hope to develop a new methodology of creative interaction between scientists, engineers, managers, administrators, public servants, executives and the society. Among the important instruments of such creative interaction that NIAS has successfully developed over the last two decades of its existence are its courses. Of these courses, the Senior Executives course, the 23rd edition of which is being inaugurated today, had the pride of place, and I should thank uh, Dr. Sangeeta Menon for having had the central role to play in organizing this course and uh, really looking into the nitty-gritty details of the uh, content and the way we wanted to conduct this. Of course, there are other members of the NIAS faculty who have actively supported her through their advice and wisdom, like Professor Srikantan, Professor uh, Pani is here, Professor Dilip Ahuja is here, and many of them who supported her with their wisdom and experience. We have, over the years, been fortunate to attract a number of very distinguished speakers to have the course inaugurated, and also to have the course inaugurated by eminent personalities. And this trend continues today in the person of Mr. Mohan Das Pai. I have great pleasure at this stage to introduce the speaker to you as we move forward. Mr. T.B. Mohan Das Pai, of course, I don't think that there is much of an introduction needed. He often nowadays appears in the television, and his appearance has become much more relevant than ever in the context of the present developments. Uh, Mr. T.V. Mohandas Bhai is a member of the Infosys Board and Head Administration, Human Resources and Education and Research. Mr. Pai joined Infosys in 1994 and has served as a member of the board since May 2000. He served as the Chief Financial Officer from 1994 to 2006 and then voluntarily stepped down at the CFO to lead the efforts in the areas of human resources and education and research. As the board member in charge of human resources, education and research, Mr. Fai focuses on building and strengthening the human capital of Infosys. He is engaged in setting the direction and supporting the human cap, supporting the company's people-focused activities that include talent acquisition, talent engagement, and talent deployment. Mr. Pai is keen, also keen on human capital initiatives in the larger societal complex context. He has been the driving force behind the Campus Connect program directed towards creating large-scale systematic change in engineering education. This program aims to help academia improve its output by producing industry-ready engineering graduates with better knowledge and capability. The program is also of strategic importance to Infosys as the company recruits large numbers of engineering graduates to fuel its growth. Mr. Pai has also played a leadership role in Infosys initiatives to help several state governments in their quest for providing greater access to quality education. Mr. Pai played a key role in the listing of Infosys on NASDAQ and its sponsored secondary offering of American depository shares, both first for an India-registered company. He was voted CFO of the year in 2001 by IMA India and won the best CFO in India award from Finance Asia in 2002 and the best chief financial officer in India in the Asia Money Best Managed Companies Poll 2004. Mr. Pai has been actively working with regulators to improve the business ecosystem. He was a member of the Kelkar Committee constituted by the Ministry of Finance, Government of India for reforming direct taxes, and a member of the Non-Resident Taxation Committee, the High Powered Committee on E-Commerce and Educa uh, Taxation. He is currently on the board of SEBI and also a member of the SEBI Accounting Standards Subcommittee and the Empowered Committee for Setting Up Tax Information Network with the Indian Government. Mr. Bai 
is a trustee of the International Accounting Standards Committee and foundation that oversees the International Accounting Standards Board. He is also a member of Board of Governors of the Institute of Public Enterprise in Hyderabad, India. Mr. Pai, of course, holds a bachelor's degree in commerce and a law degree from Bangalore University and is a fellow of the Chartered Accountant. Mr. Pai's keen interest in primary education and social development activities. He is currently working, and in fact, that is one of the things I just want to emphasize on an Akshaya Patra Foundry. It's a very unique innovation on a midday meal program to feed over 830,000 children in government schools in Bangalore rural and urban areas in Matra, Hubli, Jaipur, etc., with an aim to build a million children daily by 2010. And we, when he sets a target, he always makes sure that he meets it and even more than that. My own personal association dates back to several years with Mohan. I have often tapped his talents in small, small things that I happen to do. We were very closely associated on the Rajasthan Education Commission with the then government setup, and we had a wonderful time over almost a year working together in trying to evolve a system for Rajasthan in the context of human resource development, of which he is one of the experts and his association was greatly beneficial in coming out with very pragmatic recommendations to be submitted to the then government of Rajasthan in the context of improving the various segments of education, training, and other types of knowledge activities. I have also, of course, been privileged to associate with him in getting his advice on many other things. And more recently also, I should say, he is also he's a philanthropist of a very unique kind. He is a kind of person, once he is convinced, and this conviction can be easily brought to him in a typical flight from Bangalore to Delhi. All you need is about two hours of uh, talking to him, and he, of course, doesn't allow you to talk much. But when he talks and when you reply, I think he gets convinced about a certain point, then you can be sure that he supports on that. And one such example is the one where he, I got the benefit of instituting a mathematics prize at this institute, which we call it the Infosys Prize. It's an Infosys mathematics prize, the like of which the country does not have. You get a five lakh award to the best mathematician below 45 years. And I should say that when I discussed the questions of mathematics education on which Professor Srikantan put quite a lot of homework, and when I explained to him, it's a 10 lakh award. Well, okay. I was thinking of the next one that he was thinking. Okay. <laughs> it's 10 lakh. It's a very unique award. And he said that what about a, what is the kind of uh, corpus fund that you need to keep this award going? And I said it will be about a crore. The next Saturday he comes to my office, writes out a check, and gives me this is from my personal savings. Take it and institute this award. So that is Mohan. And we are really fortunate to have him here today morning. Uh, for inaugurating this important course. I once again welcome all of you and wish you a very happy and pleasant and fruitful stay at Bangalore. Thank you. Mohan. Dr. Kasturi Nangan, Dr. Sangeeta, ladies and gentlemen, I am deeply honored to be here to talk to you about a subject on which there is considerable debate in India today, particularly in corporate circles. It's been very kind of Dr. Kasturi Rangan to say many kind things about me. I do not deserve all that he has said, but nevertheless will try to come up to his expectations. We have a challenge in corporate India today with the Satyam episode, which reinforces what we need to do in the area of leadership in India. We have a company which has been in the forefront of the IT change in India, a company which has shown great growth. We have an entrepreneur who has been held up as a leader of a new India, particularly in the state of Andhra Pradesh. And we have had a very horrible exposure of all that can go wrong in a corporate organization, led by a person who was once held up to be an exemplary person, an example of great leadership. This brings to the fore many questions which we need to answer as a country and as a people about leadership and the attributes of leadership. What went wrong? I would like to give you my assessment. What went wrong essentially was the innate human emotion of greed and fear came to the fore 
for a leader of this company. Falling behind in the race for growth, having started this company and having received the accolades from various interests and being shown up as an exemplary leader, particularly by government authorities, he, I do believe, started doing things just to demonstrate his continued leadership in this industry. The things that went wrong in changing and creating a new financial statement, which was not based upon data or facts, led to a situation when it became so big that he had no other option but to confess and to state to everybody how there had been large-scale manipulation of financial records for maybe seven to eight years. <coughs> it shows immediately a weakening of the moral fiber when faced with uncertainty, when faced with a very adverse economic environment. So it brings to the fore a very essential attribute of leadership, that is a leader should have a moral fiber which enables the leader to stand up to adverse circumstances and to be honest at all times without succumbing to greed or to fear. To, to understand how people need to handle this, we need to look at the life of Mahatma Gandhi. I think many of the ills that we face in the area of leadership and in, the, in, in many areas of a country needs an examination of what Gandhiji would have done if he had been faced with this circumstance. A leader needs to be courageous. A leader needs to have immense courage to face the situations that are thrown up from time to time. Gandhiji throughout his life demonstrated this courage. And the courage has to be moral in its scope. The courage is not something based upon an organization. The courage is not something based upon the use of force, but has to be individualistic, and it has to be based upon a moral fiber. When faced with the greatest empire the world has ever seen, Gandhiji stood up as one single person, standing up for the poor, impoverished people of this great country to fight for the oppressed and to ensure that by his fight, he led more than half the world's population to freedom and to their own and, and to the right to make their own fortune. And at various times in his career, Gandhiji demonstrated that he is willing to step back from the ideals that he fought for at all times, but will not succumb to temptation, will not succumb to something that he believed was not right. The biggest example of all this is what happened in Chauri Chowda, I think in the 1930s, late 1930s, if I'm right. Gandhiji had called for a non-cooperation movement. The country rose as one. People marched on the streets of various small towns and cities in India, facing the police lathis and the police budets. Many individuals gave up their lives to fight for freedom, and they fought in a non-violent manner. But in Chauri Chowda, I think in Bihar, a group of people attacked a police station and burned some policemen alive. Gandhiji was agonized. He looked within himself and asked the question, have I been able to convince my fellow Indians about the need for nonviolence, about the need to ask for freedom in a very different manner? Have I been able to get, let, allow them to get over the basic instincts? And he decided that he'd rather call off the non-cooperation movement than go ahead with violence. Gandhiji believed in the principle. Gandhiji believed in non-violence. Gandhiji believed in the moral fiber of the human being. And Gandhiji believed that unless a human being stood up for what he believed in, there was no future. And he called off. That means the end was not important. The means were very, very important. And in the Satyam episode, we've seen that the end became more important than the means. And to me, that's a very important lesson that all of us have to learn. In our corporate life, in our personal life, very often we do not achieve success. We will fail. Failure is a fact of life. And it's important for all of us to stand up and accept failure. Stand up and tell everybody that, yes, we are not going to succeed this time. We have tried our best. And we want to tell everybody because we are trustees of all that you've given us. And if we fail, it is failure not for want of, not for want of trying, but failure because it is beyond our control, beyond our capability. And then nevertheless, carry on. So the Satyam said, when faced with failure, when faced with lack of growth, when faced with a very competitive situation, the, the chairman decided to manipulate financial records to show a picture which did not exist. 
So it is a lack of a moral fiber. The second issue that comes up in this Satyam episode is another very unique issue. Whenever you have an organization, an organization creates a structure. The structure has to be sustainable. And every structure has checks and balances within. And every structure has a system of governance which needs to be nurtured by the leader. And the leader has to believe in the governance mechanism to make the structure succeed, particularly in the corporate world. So in a, in a corporate organization, you have the shareholders on one side, you have a board appointed by the shareholders, then you have management. Management has the right to run a company to achieve the objective set by the board. The board of directors are elected by the shareholders to take care of their interest and to take care of all stakeholders' interests. And all the three have to work in unison and have to work in an open, democratic, collegial manner. The failure of one leads to the failure of corporate governance in the entire sector. So what happened here? The institutional arrangement in the company seems to have broken down. When you have a board, to enable the board to function, you have committees of the board, like an audit committee, a nomination committee, and maybe you know, some other committees. And these committees lies with outside agencies to get an independent opinion to allow them to do their work. Because the board in a corporate organization had a fiduciary responsibility. A fiduciary responsibility means a responsibility akin to a trustee. They are the trustee of stakeholders' interest. They have to put the stakeholders first before themselves. And they have to do that because that's their job. Otherwise, they shouldn't be there. And that's why in corporate boards, you have somebody called, people called independent directors. Directors who are not aligned with management. Directors who don't have the burden of management on them. And directors who have to step back and take decisions which is in the larger interest rather than narrow interest. And here, this institutional arrangement of keeping checks and balances seems to have broken down. I will not blame the independent directors in this episode. Unlike everybody who says the independent directors are to blame and they're not in a job, I would not blame them. I would not blame them. I will not blame them for one important reason. The institutional arrangement which had to be nurtured by the management broke down. That means you have the internal auditor who is supposed to get into the financial statements and report back to the audit committee that did not do the job. You need to have the outside auditor, the statutory auditor, who is supposed to look at the financial statements and certify to the board that things are as per the law and they have no, they, have, they will give an opinion, of the opinion that the financial statements are true and fair. And they did give an opinion. And then you have this audit committee which is supposed to ask questions, get into issues based upon the reports given by these people and maybe hire independent consultants to help them to come to a conclusion. The whole institutional arrangements needs to be nurtured by management. It's very important that it's nurtured by management. It cannot be left on its own because left on its own it will collapse. And when I say nurtured by management, management should review the practices, work with the senior independent directors and make sure the structure gets the resources and the capability and the independence required. Independent directors need to meet on their own without management to ensure that any fears or any information they have is, is discussed, debated, and they take an independent voice. In this case, I think the structure broke down. And the structure broke down and did not work. And I think it is, it's, it's very important today when you talk about leadership of organization, to create structures which have checks and balances on the power of everybody. And that's what democracy is all about. Even in society, democracy works best because democracy has checks and balances. Dr. Amatya Sen made a very seminal point when he said that in a democracy, there cannot be people dying of famine. There cannot be people dying for lack of food in a very large manner. Because the democracy implies the existence of a vibrant press and the press existence of an opposition, existence of a structure which will bring all this force to, a, to the notice of a government and force a government or force the management of a country in a corporate language to do something to prevent this catastrophe. So there are checks and balances. And here the checks and balances obviously did not work and there the management failure is very much greater. The next thing that, needs, the next thing that comes out in the episode is another very important aspect of leadership. The important aspect of leadership is to create a structure where no single person has the power or the authority and is so larger than life that he can manipulate or he can create a, a, a system which can go wrong. That means you have to create an information network where a large number of people participate in, 
in decision making. If you look at societies worldwide, the society is run by dictators. Now, dictators by, by choice give a lot of power to themselves. Dictators by choice ensure that nobody else can take a decision. Dictators by choice ensure that they create a structure where they are the only ones who are empowered and they rule by fear. We saw what happened in the emergency in India when our late Prime Minister Indira Gandhi imposed emergency on the Indian people. The emergency led to the creation of a structure where the leader was cloistered, kept away from what happened to the people. There was no feedback mechanism. There were no checks and balances. As a result, you were isolated, you were kept alone, and you did not get the information that is required by you to take decisions. And it all happened because the structure was totally wrong. The structure was not open. And when you have a closed system, the closed system does not work very efficiently. And the same thing seems to happen in Satyam, where information flows in the entire system is totally wrong. For example, in Infosys, we have created a system where about 10,000 people get access to financial information for the work that they do. And more than 100 people get financial information at the enterprise level. And it's all on a system and a platform where people can access independently and where data inputs come. And because there are so many people who get the information, we do believe that's very difficult for any single individual or any single entity or any single person to manipulate or create records which may not exist. In Satyam, from whatever information we got about what happened, the fixed deposits seem to have been manipulated by the chairman and the CEO. The CFO denies that he knew about these fixed deposits, and the fixed deposits seem to be entirely fictitious. The auditors seem to have accepted the statement of the management that this fixed deposit exists, when fixed deposits do not exist. So once again, the inability of a leader to create a structure within the organization and not to centralize power but to rule and based upon policies, rule based upon vision, rule based upon the ability to create something which is very different, a cause larger than life, seems to have been given a go-by. Once again, an institutional failure of a very high order. From all this, what do we learn about the principles of leadership? What do we learn about principles that can enable us to excel? Let me put some things before you. One, leadership is all about having a large enough vision which will enable a person to lead a team to achieve the objectives set for themselves, either for a corporate organization or for a society. Jawaharlal Nehru, writing in prison, once seems to have written that while the world can maybe fault us for the quality of a vision, they cannot fault us ever for the lofty high ideals that we set for ourselves. So you need to have a vision. Gandhiji had this great vision of leading his people from oppression to freedom. And Gandhiji did not have these resources, but he had a vision that he will lead his people from oppression to freedom, to, to freedom through non-violence, through not taking up the gun, and through creating leaders in society to enable this transformation to happen. And he succeeded. So leadership is all about having a large vision. And the vision has got to be large. The vision has got to be simple so it can be communicated. Bill Gates had a large vision. And the vision was to have a PC on every, in every desk on every home. It's a very small vision, a small statement. Because if you have a very large vision, which, which requires a lot of language, it gets lost in transmission. A vision is something that you communicate to somebody, and the recipient should be able to understand and assimilate, or that the recipient is able to participate in the execution of this vision. And the vision has got to be so large that it excites people. For example, in India, we have this Chandrayaan mission. And I was with Dr. Kasri Rangan when he was talking to the former HRD minister, talking about this large mission. Now, the whole notion of, of, of India, of an Indian going to the moon, is so large, is so extraordinary, that all over India in schools and colleges, children are excited. In fact, I was speaking to my son, and I was telling him that maybe after he finished engineering, he must work with ISRO in this project. Because this is a project of a lifetime. And if I can get excited as a business person, you can imagine what it means for children all over, how this large-scale mission can suddenly transform the thinking of a people. We must remember what happened with John F. Kennedy when he said America will land a man on the moon in 10 years. It transformed America. It refocused the American nation on science and technology and gave it an edge. And the lack of such a vision after landing on the moon is possibly responsible for the crisis in Wall Street. Because the best and brightest people in America gravitated towards Wall Street to create financial structures and to create high income for themselves, instead of gravitating towards 
an area where they could advance whatever they needed to advance in the society. So therefore, the vision has to be very large. Second, the leader should have courage to implement the vision. That means he must have a personal attribute of great courage. And courage is important because leadership is all about standing up alone. If you see what happened when Kargil, Kargil was started by Pakistan in India, we heard many stories of a young officers who led their troops to battle. There is a story of this young person, 22, 23 year old lieutenant, who was leading his troops, climbing up a cliff because it appears the Pakistani rangers were on top of a plateau. So he had to climb up this hill, climb up this cliff. And while climbing up the field, while climbing up this cliff, suddenly they were firing from the top and they were exposed. So many people who were climbing up got shot and this young man hung on the cliff for up to 40 hours, not daring to move because he would have been shot till the Air Force came and strapped the people at the top and allowed him to come on top. And when he came on top, and he was leading from the front, as an officer leading from the front, and when he came on the top, he radioed his, uh, he radioed his uh, seniors, his officers, and said, sir, we have conquered, we have conquered, we have achieved our objective. And he said, a dil mangta more. A dil mangta more, yes. And by his own example, he was able to lead his troop. So that he required immense courage as a leader. And leadership is all about being alone. You look at what Alexander did, maybe in 300 BC. Alexander was the son of King Philip of Macedonia, a small Greek state, a state of no great consequence. Athens and other city-states looked down upon Macedonia as a backward state, a state bereft of any intellectual accomplishment. But Alexander had something special in him. Alexander, at a very young age, said that he is going to conquer the world. Now, a small city-state with a small army going around to conquer the world and fighting against a great empire, the great empire called the Persian Empire. So he, along with a small troops, small number of troops, marched against the Persians and achieved great victories. In all this, Alexander led the way. He led the troops from the front. So he had immense courage. He did not stay in the background and order people to lead. So leadership is all about courage. Leadership is all about leading from the front. Leadership is all about leading by example. I think if you're a leader and if you want your followers to do something for you and you do not lead by example, you will never be able to succeed. Rajiv Gandhi made a speech in the, in the House of Commons, in the joint house session of the House of Commons and House of, I'm sorry, House of Representatives and the Senate in the United States. And he gave a story about Gandhiji, which I'm very fond of reciting. It appears a, a mother went with her son to Gandhiji and told Gandhiji, Gandhiji, my son is very fond of sweets. I know that is not good for him, but will you please advise him not to take the sweets? Gandhiji told her to come back with her son 15 days later. And when 15 days later, she came back, Gandhi told the young man that it is not good for him to eat sweets, it's not good for his health, and he'll be okay without sweets. So she was curious and asked him, Gandhiji, why did you take 15 days? You could have told him the same day. He said, I went without eating sweets for 15 days to find out how it is. Because unless I do something, how can I ask somebody to do something else? So I cannot be able to explain to people what they should do unless I experience it myself. So Gandhiji never asked anybody to fast unless, and he fasted himself. He understood the pain of fasting. And he always took on the greatest challenges upon himself. He led from the front. He led from the front in South Africa. He led this group of unarmed people at, you know, marching against the police. And he said, I'll break any unjust law. In the Dandi march, he led from the front and he, he, took the, he made salt on the ground and then he was arrested. And he went to jail many times. So a leadership is all about leading by example. And if you do not lead by example, the people that you lead will never respect you. So leadership has to demonstrate a very much higher quality than anything else. And you need to have the attribute. For example, today we are faced with a very uncertain economic environment. This uncertain economic environment calls for great sacrifice from all of us to get through. It could mean that many people may lose their jobs. It could mean that many people, many companies may not be able to pay the salaries that they committed. But here, companies that have leaders who take the pain on themselves, who ensure that their compensation is cut first, who ensure that the small, small frills that they enjoy as leaders is cut first, who ensure that they tighten the belt first, they are the ones to succeed. When many people come and visit us, they ask us, why is it that Indians, as a people, focus on education? And we always tell them the stories of Indian mothers. 
And if you look at a society, you'll find that a mother's aspiration is to educate a child. And a mother's in this country will eat one meal less, but they will educate the child. And because they educate the child, they will ensure the child's success. My mother was a school teacher. And you know, she walked to school every day for 30 years, five kilometers every day for 30 years to say she will save the bus fare to educate me. We did not need that money, but she did it. And I think these are great attributes for leaders in corporate organizations. And as you rise up the ladder, as you build large organizations, we must remember the thousands of people looking up to us for leadership and they take cues from us. And if we demonstrate leadership by example, we will certainly, we will certainly succeed. Another area for being excellent in leadership is an ability to create a large number of people to lead under you. Now, this is a very important issue for corporate organizations and society to succeed. And the greatest example, once again, is Mahatma Gandhi. When we went through this freedom struggle, we, India had a large number of great leaders. India had many bright, well-educated people, lawyers, lawyers, you know, teachers, and many, and many other people who came to the fore to fight for freedom. And a large number of leaders sprung from ordinary people. When the civil disobedience movement took place, when the Quit India movement took place, we had Pardanashi women come out and march in the streets. We had ordinary children from schools who gave up their careers to march in the streets. And they all came forth because they responded to the call of Gandhiji. And some of this man had this ability to create leadership qualities in very ordinary people. And he did not feel insecure. He rejoiced in the creation of many leaders. And he allowed them to take center stage. So and so, when India finally got independence, he was somewhere, I think, in Naukali, trying to, put, trying to make sure that the rights did not lead to greater destruction. And this innate ability of a leader to create many leaders is what sustains organizations, sustains societies. If a leader is insecure, if a leader is not able to enthuse people, if a leader is not able to build leadership teams, then it will be a challenge. And I would take the example of Pandit Nehru and what happened after independence in India itself. After independence, we saw a sudden decline in the quality of leadership in the political area. Today, the middle class in this country bemoans the fact that we don't have, in our opinion, what we call great leaders. And why is it that we bemoan the fact? We bemoan the fact because the institutional arrangement which allowed many people to enter political life seems to have degenerated after freedom when the educated middle class gravitated towards the economic area rather than the social or political area. It also was a part of the culture of an organization which ruled this country which did not allow many, many leaders from the state to come up because centralization of power, lack of an open democratic process did not lead to the creation of leaders. The same thing happens in organization. Only those organizations which create leaders at various different levels, which allow an open, transparent, collegial environment in companies, which allow people to dissent, which allow people to question many attributes that the leaders may have, where meritocracy prevails, where the best argument always wins, and not people who are higher up in the hierarchy, that kind of a culture, that kind of an organization creates a set of leaders which can take companies forward. And I think this is a very important attribute that we learn, because unless leaders, leaders are created, an organization has no future. We have seen in corporate life the existence of people called as superstar CEOs. Superstar CEOs create an aura among themselves. Now, Jack Welch was a superstar CEO. He ruled for 20 years. He was an absolute tyrant. His word was law. He also tried to ensure that GE was sustainable by creating a leadership process and creating a large number of leaders. So he did succeed in sustaining GE's growth over a period of years. But if you look at many other companies where we had superstar CEOs, and once the CEOs went away, <coughs> there were not many leaders, you find that it is extremely essential that a leader creates other leaders, and it's only those people who create great leaders are the people who sustain. Because when the leader exists, there's suddenly a leadership vacuum, and the leadership vacuum is not good. And if a person creates a leadership vacuum, it speaks very much about the leader himself because he's unable to create the next generation of leaders. The next attribute of leadership is the pursuit of excellence. Now, the pursuit of excellence is very hard and tough. And why should companies pursue excellence? Why should societies pursue excellence? Companies and societies should pursue excellence for the simple reason that the pursuit of excellence creates an ecosystem which enables you to be competitive and to survive and grow. 
If you do not pursue excellence, if you do not pursue, if you pursue shoddy, a shoddy way of working and always keep lower standards, your ability to sustain yourself will be considerably impaired. And there are innumerable examples all over the world. Let's take the example of Toyota. Toyota, when it started off immediately after the Second World War or thereafter, was a small company which made shoddy grooves. Japan as a society was a society which made shoddy goods. In the 1950s and 60s, Japan made very, very cheap goods and sold them around the world. And quality was certainly not on the radar. But, let, but Japan learned from Juran, Japan learned from Demings, and Japan created a quality culture by doing, bringing in many practices so and so, their pursuit of excellence allowed them to create an economy which dominated the world in the 80s and the early part of the 90s. So they pursued excellence. And there are other examples of companies which have pursued excellence and which have made sure that they succeeded. And you know, these, these examples have to be taken by us to ensure that, what, that things are done. Let's take the example of Singapore. Singapore today is a standing example of a small city state which was led by a very charismatic leader, Lee Kuan Yew, to, uh, who created a great modern society out of a very backward city state with no resources. What does Singapore have? Singapore has no natural resources. It has a harbor, it is an island, it is an anthropod, it is a place where trade takes place. Apart from that, it had no human talent, it had no great educational experience, it is not a center of education. But here was a man who decided that he's going to transform this place. In fact, <coughs> Lee Yuan Q visited us at Infosys, and we discussed this issue with him as to what he did. And he told us a very fascinating story. He said that when he became the leader of his party, and when he became the prime minister, when he broke off from Malaysia, the Malayans, Mal Malaysians did not want him in the country. He fought against them, and they told him to get out. He said, you can be separate. We don't want you in a federation, because Malaysia was a federation called the Federation of Malay States. So they threw him out. And when he suddenly was thrown out, he realized that he had nothing. He had a communist party and trade unions in Singapore, which could scabble and create terror and create violence in society, and they were not able to do anything. He had structures and policies which did not allow free trade. So he said, I was very shocked when I became the prime minister and realized that I had the responsibility of looking after these people, but there's nothing, no resources at my command. So he said, let us do some small things to open up the system. He created a very liberal, open environment and a liberal policies which allowed multinational others to come into Singapore and operate freely without government restrictions. And he said he's going to build great infrastructure. The first thing he did was to build a great airport and a good road from the airport to town and a good hotel. And he called CEOs from all over the world to come and to do business. So CEOs flew in on the carpet, just landed in this nice airport. They were impressed. They took the nice road, came to the nice hotel. They signed deals with him and went back. They didn't visit the shanty towns. They didn't visit all those areas which were slums. They didn't visit the poor areas. But he was able to create a brand equity for himself because he focused on excellence in particular areas. Then he came out with a city, a city plan, a 40-year, 50-year perspective plan, how to develop Singapore. And he worked on it. He had a plan. He worked on it. And he made sure that it executed well. He made sure there was no corruption. There is a story told about him, which I don't know whether it's true or maybe one of the stories that people made up, that he once had a minister whom he, whom he heard had taken money to give a contract. So he called these ministers to his room and told him, there are two or three things that you can do. I know that you've taken money. There are two or three things you can do. One, you can stand up in parliament, confess, and you can say that you've done it because I got evidence. You'll be arrested and thrown into jail, and you'll not come out. Two, you can shoot yourself. And he's told that the minister shot himself because he lost face. For each society, something called face is very important. They want respect. And I think, the same thing happened, and we, said, and we asked him this question, did it really happen? And he said, well, I don't want to answer that question. But over a period of time, it transformed this small island nation into a center of excellence where public services work, there is no corruption, there is no bribery, people have 85% of the population has housing to stay, and the government is surplus in its revenues and has created a cash hoard which can take up, which can take them far, which can take them far. And he, and, he, and he pursued excellence. He could have done some shoddy work. He could have said, I'll be second class. I don't have to all do all this. But he did not. And therefore, for every corporate organization, the pursuit of excellence is extremely important. Next, leadership is all about being innovative 
and being flexible to change. Now, there is one stark thing that, that strikes you if you look around the world in corporate organization. Why is it that there's only one company which has been in the Dow Jones Index for the last 100 years, that is General Electric? In the early part, in the early part of the 20th century, there were very many great companies in America. Companies like, you know, U.S. Steel, General Motors, we know what is happening. And there are companies like AT&T, etc. All these companies are gone. They've gone down the tube. What is it that led to just one company being in this Dow Jones Index for 100 years? And this company, what special attribute did this company have? Now, when we ask many people, many academics as to how this company succeed, they made two points. One, they said that this company was driven by innovation. It meant that it had a business model, which was very successful, but it changed its business model every 10 years. It was flexible in response to changes in the environment. It led from the front. It made sure that new technologies were put into place, which drove its ability to sustain itself. It also made sure that they could jettison old assets. Because there's a saying in business, the only thing that you do not sell is your, maybe your wife. Everything else in business is saleable. Businesses are a portfolio which you sell when they don't create money. Because the ultimate objective of business is to enhance return on investment. So return on investment means that you can change your businesses, you can have a portfolio of businesses, you can sell them off, you can change, but if you get stuck to one and <coughs> you find the innovation curve is against you, then you will not succeed. Therefore, leadership in business is all about being innovative, being creative, being flexible, and responding to changes in the ecosystem. Standing firm on one business plan, standing firm on one idea will not allow you to succeed in the long run. And the last thing that I want to touch about on to touch about in leadership is what makes leadership, leadership quality sustainable. Now in the corporate world, we are faced with another unique factor, and that factor is companies and structures are got long life, but individuals do not have a long life. And in fact, the very fact that Western civilization created this kind of a corporate structure, it seems, has led Western civilization to dominate the world. If you go back thousands of years in history, the Eastern civilizations, China, India, did not have anything like a corporate structure. In India, we had the Hindu united family, like Karta system, a semi-partnership. China did not have any structures like that. The Islamic civilization did not have this kind of a structure. But the Western civilization came with a corporate structure, a corporate structure where they created an artificial entity which had long life, an artificial entity which could take capital from a large number of people, an artificial entity which had a life greater than the life of the people who created, or the life of the people who ran the business. And this innovation, it appears, sociologists say, and many business people say, allowed Western civilization to dominate. So, leadership is about creating the sustainable ecosystem which allow things to grow. I want to stop here and I want to, uh, you know, respond to many questions that you might have. I just want to go through uh, what I have said so far. I think that excellence in leadership has to do with the, with the availability or the existence of a very large vision for a leader. It has to do with a lot of courage on the part of leadership. It has to do with leadership having a moral fiber. It has to do with leadership which is willing to lead by example. It has to do with leadership which is innovative, which is flexible, which responds to the ecosystem. It has to do with leadership which is interested in creating many more leaders under them and creating a sustainable environment. It has to do with the pursuit of excellence. And above all, above all, it has to do with the creation of individual people who will drive business or drive societies through their vision and through courage. Thank you very much, and I'll be happy to answer any questions that you might have. Yes, sir. Perhaps you should uh, introduce yourself for a couple of seconds. And myself, Niti Shah, I'm from Power Finance Corporation, Delhi. Uh, my question is how to cop up the opposition? A leader, how he will cop up with the opposition in his ideas or values or what he wants to take up? So I'll just have you. Well, I think uh, leadership is about the power of ideas. Victor Hugo said, Nothing can stop the march of an idea whose time has come. 
And in the context of Victor Hugo, it is about the idea that a society could exist without a king, that they could have a republic, they could have open democracy in France, and that changed the world. So, leadership is an ability to have an idea of yourself, idea of the enterprise, an ability to market and sell the ideas to others. In fact, uh, Nandan has written a beautiful book, Ideas for the New Century, uh, India Ideas for the New Century, and his thesis is very clear. He says, human society is advanced because the growth of ideas, the ability of certain people to propagate those ideas and to sell those ideas and create a consensus on the idea, so societies move forward based upon this idea. So even in corporate organizations, if you want to succeed, you should have the you should have the intellectual capability to propagate an idea of the enterprise, an idea of the business where you have to be, and to answer questions, and to market it, and collectively create a consensus among people so that the idea dominates. And you, as the propagator of the idea, can also carry forward. So I think it's an idea. In Infosys, we say that we are a company of ideas where the best idea always wins. Yes, sir. Well, I think uh, we need to understand uh, how an open democratic system works. An open democratic system and an open liberal society is given to excesses, is given to excesses. And societies which are open and democratic run on human emotion to a very large way. Socialistic structures run on a very rigid mechanism. And in an open democratic society where people are prone to excesses, and being and excesses are a natural way, are a natural, are natural to human beings. There, are, there comes time when a particular idea or a particular way tends to dominate and where people give up all fears about failure and go along the path. It's happened in many, many, uh, many, many times. You had the great uh, Tulip bubble, you had the South Sea Island bubble, then you had uh, the Great Depression in 1929, and then you had this latest issue. <coughs> what happened was that over the last 25, 30 years, the brightest mind gravitated toward the financial sector away from manufacturing, away from science and technology to find greatest returns. And the financial sector got considerably liberalized and deregulated because people felt that innovation and a globalized order requires such a structure. Profits from financial enterprises went up from 9% of GDP in the United States 10 years ago, something like 40% last year. And because this was not based upon real economic growth, it led to a situation where people created structures to create income and to create profits, and that led to great excesses. It was also a failure of regulations. So I would say that the, that the whole structure failed. Is the structure bad? The structure is not bad. But the structure failed. The same thing in a social system like the Soviet Union. What happened to the Soviet Union? In 1920, 1930, the oppressed people of the world, the emerging markets always felt that the Soviet way of life was the best. The Soviet Union had the best human development index. They had the largest number of educated people. And people did not lack food in the 60s and 70s, even though there was a lot of oppression and there's a secret police within the system. Yet the Soviet Union failed. And why did it fail? Because there was excesses because they spent more on the military, much beyond their ability to succeed. Now, take a case of Japan. Japan in the 1980s and 1990s, early part of the 90s, and the entire decade of the 80s, Japan created a financial bubble because of excess money coming to Japan on account of its own success. It created an asset bubble, it led to a uh, stock market bubble, and the bubble blew up, except that the Japanese did not recognize the bubble and take action. They did not write out the assets. So Japan has been not growing for the last 15 years. So my answer to your question would be that it is inherent 
in an open democratic liberal society that such excesses come. The key thing is for good regulations and for people to understand what it means and to take appropriate action. Can we prevent it? No. Can we minimize it? Yes. Even in India, we've seen that. We had this bubble in 92, I mean 92, 94. We had this bubble again, I think, about seven, eight years back. We again had this bubble. And is it going to happen again? Absolutely, it's going to happen again. Can you minimize it? Maybe, yes. But can we eliminate it? No. It's inherent in the beast. Yes, sir. Well, I will uh, just carry on from uh, where I answer, gentlemen, and I'll answer your question. In an open, liberal, democratic system, every time there's an excess, people, society looks within itself to see where the excess came from and why was it not attended to earlier, and they change rules and regulations. And so long as the system punishes people who are responsible for the excess and gives them exemplary punishment, a deterrent punishment, People, people's trust in the system is reinforced and society carries on. You know, this, this, this kind of a check and balance, that is things go wrong, but you make sure that people are punished, is responsible for people's trust in the system to come back. And lack of trust in a system inhibits growth, inhibits economic expansion. So I think the Satyam episode is a wake-up call for India, and if the whole world is looking to see what happens in India. You know, we went through this process where many people asked us, is India's image going to be dented? Well, maybe. Is the world st going to stop doing business with India? No. It's happened all over the world. Then what are the, what are the world looking up to? The world is waiting to see whether Indian regulators and the government will take action. They will punish the perpetrators. They do it in a speedy manner. And what regulation they're going to bring to make sure the lessons from this are learned and we don't repeat it again. To me, that's the key. For the Satyam episode, I think so far the government has shown its keenness to take steps. They superseded the board, they got in a new board, they put the Satyam CEO and CFO into jail, they're setting up an investigation committee, and all of us want the government to act fast, to prosecute, set up a special court, and to punish the perpetrators. And then, come out with some bit of regulation, because there are some loopholes in the system which need to be plugged so that it doesn't repeat again. And I think this is very important. And that's why in America you found the existence of something called third-party liability suits. And there's another check and balance. You create, you do wrong, you are caught, the people who punish, people who suffer, file cases against you and get compensation. And the fear of compensation reduces, reduces the ability of people in future to do the same thing because they're scared. Now in India we have seen that many people do not pay income tax. We know them. We can see it in the lifestyle. Nothing happens to them. So what happens? Everybody says, why should I pay my tax? Because he's not paying his tax. And why should I suffer? So it becomes a system where people are caught up in this argument, not about, not about you know, following the law, doing right, but doing wrong. I know I, a cousin of mine in Bombay told me a very interesting story just uh, two days ago. He said he stays in an apartment block where there are 180 people. All of them are journalists, well-to-do people, educated middle class, where each flat costs 80 lakhs to a crore. So they're well-to-do, okay? I mean, well-to-do, professional class. It seemed they had a meeting. And the meeting was all the residents to say, you know, we'll have to pay one lakh tax, house tax. We shall get together, and if we bribe the BMC engineers, he'll reduce the tax to 75,000. It was shocking. Who was talking, journalist? All the, some of the people who came on TV and said this is all wrong, some of the people who condemned the, what happened in, in, in Mumbai, same kind of people saying we should pay the bribe and reduce the tax. And my cousin asked them, how can you do this? How can you do this? You're standing up for some principle you want to do wrong. They're saying, no, no, but uh, everybody is doing that. So I think the issue again comes back. There is no deterrent punishment. If society does not give a deterrent punishment to people who break the law, they will break the law. I think that's the issue. I hope I answered the question. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. No, please, please sit on. Please sit on, sir. Please sit on.
in agreement. But this is also true that all these things cannot be built in a day. Yes. Then the fundamental question is, can the leadership <coughs> be really imbibed or is it intrinsic in a person to some extent? Well, let me say this. There are many theories of leadership. I mean, it's not, I didn't want to dwell on that because I thought I'll, I'll talk about something contemporary. There's a theory of leadership which says that, there's a heroic theory of leadership where they say that, you know, people, people respond to a situation and they demonstrate leadership. For example, there's a crisis, somebody responds to a crisis and demonstrates leadership. The, most, the, the example which is very topical is Lech Walsia, who was the former uh, uh, you know, president of Poland. Do we remember that uh, in Poland, they had a strike in a shipyard? And Lech Walsia was one of those uh, employees in the shipyard, and they, they all went on strike against the Polish premier. That's before the Berlin Wall came down. And they're all striking. They had no leaders. Suddenly, this man stood on a wall and rallied the people together and said, we will fight. So the situation created a man who became a leader. He's a heroic way of leadership. The second is, second theory says that leaders, that lead, the people have innate leadership skills. And there is some truth in it. There are many leaders who are innate. For example, Alexander was innate, was an innate leader. The Buddha was an innate leader. Jesus was an innate leader. Shankara was an innate leader. Prophet Muhammad was an innate leader. I mean, some, they had something special in them. Maybe they're born with that attribute. But they're very rare and far spread across. They're very rare and uh, far uh, spread across. The third, the, third theory, the third theory says that leadership is an attribute which can be cultivated, which can be expressed. And that theory is gaining ground today to say that leadership is a process of creation, of situations, of people coming together, people taking advantage of something and can be cultured. For example, uh, we have a leadership institute at Infosys. About eight years ago, we went through a Malcolm Baldridge assessment, and they, they told us that you don't have a formal process of leadership training. So we set up a leadership institute which focuses on imbibing leadership skills at people at different levels. Not we, think, we don't think we're going to create another Naran Murthy. It's a very unique case. But we think that if we go from A to B in terms of leadership skills, it's well worth it. So we picked up <coughs> the top 50 people through a process, and we, the board members mentor them. Each of us mentors five to seven people. We mentor them, we talk to them, because mentorship is extremely important for leadership development. Then we expose them to different ways of thinking in academic institutions, and we give them greater responsibility. And they, in turn, mentor another 150 people, and then they, in turn, mentor another 450 people. So we created a formal structure. And the structure can take us maybe 25% ahead, 30% ahead. And ultimately, the process can be enriched. But is it going to create the next great leader? I'm not very sure. But will it help us identify the new leaders? I think the answer is yes. So leadership can also be taught through a process. It's a natural instinct. It comes because of the situation. It can also be a cultivated process. But then is it not all that important that right from the initial education stages, you see the whole pattern starts with certain, certain platforms? Yes. And if that platform is not built up at that time, I don't think that at the age Well, I think, uh, well, I, I think, I think, I think it depends on the kind of leaders, number of leaders that you want. For example, in Singapore, they have a very different process because uh, Singapore is run on the Confucius theory, which says that structures can create uh, many things. They pick up very bright students at uh, the fourth standard in age 10. They put them through a different schooling system in the hope that they'll become leaders. And then they pick up people who are extremely bright and give them jobs in government. So only the brightest get in. The French have this. The French have a oligo is almost an oligarchy of leaders where people who come from some elite institutions, some of these ecoles, are the people who get into government or become leaders in business. So actually it is a cabal of elites that rule France. But there are different structures. But I do believe that if you create an ecosystem which enables free expression of human emotion and gives opportunities to people, we will create a lot of leaders in society. I think I will see it happening. If you look around India, it's happening in a big way. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. What are the risks of a leader? Yes, sir. I beg your pardon? What are the risks involved with a leader and how to overcome those risks? Well, it's a very interesting question. To my mind, the biggest risk about a leader is what uh, Brutus spoke about Julius Caesar before the assassination. 
which Shakespeare put very well. I quote Brutus speaking about Caesar. He doth strives the world like a colossus, and we petty men peer from beneath his mighty legs to find ourselves dishonorable graves. The risk of leadership in a very large contest is the existence of a person who is so charismatic, who is so charismatic, who has become so powerful, who is such a demagogue, that it destroys the very system that created the leader, like Hitler, to be the worst example. So he becomes a superstar, and people blindly follow. People blindly follow. Jawaharlal Nehru wrote a very nice article in the Bailan Chanakya, I think, in the 1960s. Or sometime, you know, I, I read somewhere. And he said, Jawaharlal is becoming arrogant. Jawaharlal is beginning to think that there's nobody after him as a leader. And India, in fact, was asking the time, after Nehru, who? I mean, I was very, I was a child then, but I'm sure some of you will remember, after Nehru, who? Because he was the giant who was striving, he could do no wrong. And who had the vision, and all of us responded to him as a leader. So, the risk of leadership is the creation of a superstar culture. And that can only, that can only be tackled by creating an ecosystem where people can challenge somebody else. People can challenge somebody else for domination. And people do not, by the very structure they create, sustain themselves for a long time. Let me give an example in nature. Now, if you look at a pride of lions, what is the role of a male lion? The role of a male lion is possibly stand up and roar twice a day, once for the lionesses to get him food, that's the time he sleeps, and once for the hyenas to keep away from the lionesses. And of course, he gets the females for mating and all that, he passes on his genes. But a very important thing comes, that lion has to be physically strong, and there are many young lions always seeing how this lion, who is the head of the pride, behaves to make sure that the moment he shows weakness, they go after him and they drive him away and take over the pride. So nature has a system where leadership can never become self-sustaining because there are always competitors standing by, waiting for a slip-up on your side. So it is temporary. In human society, those structures can become less efficient because a leader can isolate himself and create many things around him. We saw Zia Hul Hulk do it, we couldn't, but Musharraf could not do it because the opposition was too, too much, because it was not a military state. So I think the risk of leadership is the creation of a superstar CEO, a superstar leader who is so taken up by himself that he subverts the entire system like Indira Gandhi did. And the only antidote towards that is a creation of an ecosystem which rebels against that. Yes, sir. Yes, yes, madam. I'll answer the question. I think uh, it exists in a concept which is there in the United States, which is gaining ground in India, the concept of compassionate capitalism. I think it's a very interesting concept. If you look at Europe, Europe is a very feudal country, very feudal, long history. All old societies are feudal in nature. All old societies are very feudal. They got structures, power structures, where a class of people can dominate. They got structures where a group of people dominate economic assets and they suppress others. So there are structures, and it's ingrained in the culture itself. But you look at America, a land of, land of immigrants, people who were outcasts, people who were suppressed and oppressed in other civilizations, who went there with nothing to find a new life and succeeded and created great wealth. But inevitably, 75 to 80 percent of people in America who created great wealth gave away their wealth during the lifetime and gave very little to the children. Bill Gates says, I'll only give $150 million to my children, the rest I want to give away through the Gates Foundation. Warren Buffet has given away $55 billion. So, the connection comes in an open liberal environment 
by fostering what Gandhiji called the trusteeship concept. And it's important for us in business to understand that. That as business leaders, as capitalists, we are trustees of the wealth that people have, which the Tatas embodied in creation of this institute and many things else, that we are trustees. And we've got to give back society much more than what society has given to us. And that is a notion that has to be reinforced in society. And that comes a process of compassion capitalism, where the rough edges of capitalism are rounded off by a process or by an emotional being where they put back to society much more than they get. And it has to be done through a social process where many opinion leaders talk about it, more many opinion leaders respect people who give back to society rather than respect people who are, who are keeping wealth for themselves. Today, we have the situation in India where a very large business owners have so much of wealth, but we do not see them investing in the social sector that Tatas did. Now, do people respect them as much as the Tatas? No. Do people talk about it? Yes. I think this is where it comes through. And I would put it to you, we must create a society where every individual can achieve their aspirations. A society is not against achieving aspiration. Aspiration in the economic sphere, in the social sphere, in the political sphere, etc. But at the same time, a society where respect for the individual comes because of what they do for the common good. Respect for the individual comes because, not because he's wealthy, because he's a crook, he's, a, he's, a, he's powerful, but respect comes because we think that he advances society. And the best example for this is the, is the movie Diwar. How many of you have seen the movie Diwar? You know, it's a very interesting movie. You know, I must, I'll, I'll take a while to explain this. It's a very interesting. It came out at a time, I think the late 70s and late 70s, I think, when I think the educated middle class was losing hope in the country because the economy was not growing and there was no opportunities for everybody. So the heroes of the time, and I was in college then, were smugglers. There was a guy called Karim Lala, Haji Mastan. They were all smugglers. They were all people who broke the law. And there was a Kannada movie where Rajkumar, you know, in this state, Rajkumar is a big actor, where he participated, where the neighbor was a crook in the government, you take bribes, and this person was honest, and the wife goes to him and says, you know, he's got everything, why don't we have it? Why don't you do it? He said, no, I'm going to do this. So there was this fight, and, and that movie epitomizes the fight, where for fighting for the principles, a father is ostracized, but he gives in because his child is kidnapped, the mother and two children go to Bombay. An elder son sacrifices his whole life to bring up his younger son. He fights the battle on the streets. He goes thus wrong. He becomes a smuggler. And the younger son gets educated, becomes a police officer. And there's a showdown between the two. Where so the son goes to tell the mother, my brother is a smuggler. He's done wrong. And the mother is shocked. How can my son be this? So the, though they confront him and they ask him, why have you done this? He said, Mera paas bangla hai, mera paas kar hai, mera paas paisa hai, mera paas kya hai. He tells anger, but he said, mera paas maa hai. Now, I think that movie epitomizes what went wrong in society. Because the social structure was such that ordinary people could not succeed. People who worked in the government were paid peanuts. People who worked in the public sector did not make enough money. They could not educate their children well. They suffered many privation for no fault of theirs. So that structure should go. So after 90, the structure has opened up where people get more for the talent that they have. And in this, is going to the other extreme where you can legitimately create great wealth and dominate. So we have to bring in a social structure where society respects people who give back and promotes compassion and capitalism. Then I think what you want will come into play. It's a long answer. Yes, sir. I'll take you back to the analytical statement that you made. Yes, sir. You the best friends were acted towards Wall Street. Yes, sir. Absolutely. And we find all engineers getting into some kind of a software company yes. as well. And we don't find students in science streets. Yes. So, uh, situation is worse when it comes to teaching. Yes. I've been associated with university. Yes. And, and you don't find lecturers or professors in this. Yes. Now the point is, what would corporate India do now to reverse this trend? Well, uh, <laughs> <laughs> well I'll, be, I'll be very blunt. It's not the job of corporate India to reverse this trend. It's the job of society in which corporate India participates to do something and what needs to be done. I think the basic flaw in this is the lack of an open, liberal educational system. Dr. Kassir Rangan is an expert on this. He can talk about it later. He knows it. An open, liberal education system based upon the creation and dissemination of knowledge. 
we got to create that first. And to create that, there's some policy decisions that have to be taken, autonomy for our universities, creation of structures for faculty to do research and to get compensated, and charging proper fees with a scholarship program by the government to make sure that people with no means are not deprived of education, recognition of merit, with merit alone rules. And also there are social structures to allow disadvantaged sections to come in. So you've got to rethink it and create that kind of a structure which will work. And a very large vision for the country. Do we have a science and technology vision for the country? The Chandrayaan has changed India. Chandrayaan changed India. One single project by ISRO has brought excitement to young people. I'm sure all the kids in schools and colleges, if you go now and say, come and join Chandrayaan, that will be the first choice. They'll not want to go to... Uh, Dalal Street or join software or anything else, they'll say, I'll want to do this, but pay them reasonably well. I'm afraid I may not agree with you on that because I have had this experience of addressing very bright youngsters in these Olympiad courses. And oh, they are all excited about biology, and at the end of it, you ask them, Will you take the biological research? Not even one out of 20 says that you will. You know why? We don't have a large scale stem cell research or something like that in biological sciences. But you ask people about engineering, they'll tell you, I want to go to Chandrayaan. I asked my son, he's doing electronics, and he finds it much more exciting than working in the company right now. So this is changing. I think it's changing. But as a society, we have to create that. It's a, it's a game of numbers. No it's, a, numbers no, it's not only a game of numbers, it's a game of all of us in this room as leaders understanding what we need to do for this country. Because we're not done policy changes which are required. Because remember, sir, at the time of freedom, the vice chancellor of the university was a highly respected person. In the order of warrants, he was very high. Today, who is the vice chancellor? Do we respect him in society? We don't. Do we respect the scholar? We don't as much. We respect the person with money, but not the scholar. So when you come to a stage when you respect the scholar more than the person with money, the things will change. Yes, sir. Yeah, this, yeah, this is uh, I'm Sai Baba from IGC Astro Park. First of all, uh, uh, we're excited to bring to your talk, and you identified uh, the qualities uh, required for excellence. So the question is, now listening to you, can I become an excellent leader? If you make up a mind, yes. <laughs> I think the problem, what I see is that the problem is that everybody seems to be knowing what should be done to become an excellent leader. But the question is, how do we, how do the society respond to what we want to do? It? I mean, is it something to do with already the correction process has to start much before? And in the largest part, right? like that's what you said in the, just now that the vice chancellor is more respected than that. Like how the man, man with money is respected. That means the mindset of the people is changing, and the leadership is for the people. So that means, are we re are we really thinking that much more to be done uh, if we really want to have a leadership and an excellent leader? I will give you two examples, some of which you will not agree. I I retain my faith in society to create leaders. Look at Obama. Leadership is a process of the challenge of ideas. If you want to be a leader, you must have an idea in your business, in, your, in, 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 your, in, in innovation or whatever it is. And you must be able to propagate the idea and uh, you know, excite people about the idea. Obama came with the idea of change. I mean, such an incredible story has happened before eyes in the last one year. Here is a black man in a white society with no means, no money, who suddenly says, I want to be the president of the United States, I want to bring about change. And he does that, he propagates the idea. He's well learned, he's educated, he talks about it, he excites young people, and he finally wins against the establishment. And he collects an enormous amount of money. So what is it that he had? He had, the, he had an idea, and the ability to articulate the idea, to sell the idea, to propagate the idea, and he succeeded, that's leadership. Let me give another example in India, Lalu. We might laugh at him, but I think he's an incredible leader. He's an incredible leader. What was Lalu in 1975 in the JP movement? He was a student leader. But that man captured the imagination of his constituents, not you and me. We may think he's a buffoon, he's this, but he's not. He's an extremely sure leader. He captured the imagination of his constituency. He gave them security. He recognized them. He led them and he came to power and he's done well for himself. He's an incredible leader. But he had an idea. What are the idea? He understood what the constituency wanted. What did the constituency want? The oppressed people of Bihar want a security of life. They did not want to get their, did not have their women raped. They did not want the landlords and others to take away their land. And he gave them that security. He gave them the identity. He didn't do development. No. 
He didn't do anything, but he gave them that security, that feeling that being in power, he'll protect them. And that's what they wanted. So that idea was there. So I think, I mean, in an open society, democracy is ideas that win. So if you want to be a leader, in your context, you need to have an idea, propagate the idea, sell the idea. People will rally to the flag. I beg your pardon? Yes, that defeats the moral fabric for Lalu. Lalu has gone wrong. We know that. He's gone wrong. Well, he's a leader. I mean, you know, he's inescapable that he's a leader, but doesn't have an attribute of leadership. So when you tick off against great leaders, will you put him there? No, we'll not do that. But he's a leader nevertheless. I am uh, Ram Das uh, from yeah. Titan. Yeah. Thank you very much uh, for this uh, wonderful talk, sir. Yeah. My question, of course, uh, is uh, deviation. I, I can't see. Where is it? Oh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. <laughs> OK. Sir, uh, this question, uh, I'm just making a small deviation. In this uncertain economic environment, after the US meltdown and uh, present uh, Satyam episode and uh, Bombay terror attack, while the Prime Minister uh, is saying that we'll have 7.7% GDP growth, and still uh, from the government also is saying 2009 will have a slowdown. With your exposure uh, exposed to the global environment, and uh, a corporate organization like us, we, are, we have a large responsibility towards people who would like to throw light uh, how things are likely to shape. I'm sorry for asking for your uh, ask, but with you have such a large exposure, uh, we will be very happy if you share what is really in store, how it looks like. Mr. Pai, so that like especially on the leadership front. Yeah, right. I'll, I'll take it outside. Okay. Well, <laughs> yes, yes. Well, people will vie for the leadership position. Those who lose will go. You lose, you go. It's not like the government where you succeed by seniority. So, you have got a credit system where many people or a handful of people will vie for the top post. One will succeed, the rest will leave. You will lose good talent, but that's the way it is. That's the only system that works. Because if you are discontented people at the top, it just cannot work. I think GE has demonstrated that. When uh, Jeffrey Imlet became the CEO, some four or five people left. Then they're running big companies now. They lost the battle for leadership, and that's the way it is. Yes, sir. Yes, yes. If you look to that, uh, that the first uh, when Indira Gandhi's son, uh, Sanjay Gandhi thought of making Marathi uh, with Rogue Royals, his first Marathi did not travel even from Gurgaon to Delhi. Then Indira Gandhi brought Mr. V. Krishnamurti, who took over an highway with Suzuki, and today Marathi is a brand ambassador for everything. Now, a lot of people are talking that with this Satkam collapse, maybe they are asking that Mr. Narayan Murthy should take Satyam out of that. So the, what will be the chances of success in Narayan Murthy take over this board of Satyam with the US here? Mr. Pai, would you like to take more questions and respond to this? No, I will just respond in one word. I'll take more questions. Zero. Zero. It will not work. It will not work. There's a conflict of interest. And leadership is about addressing conflicts of interest. So you can't do it. Yeah. Any other questions? By 2020, it is thought that India will be the economic power, and out of that, there will be a big constituent uh, from the IT sector. But the thing which is lacking is the leadership promoting the innovation in the IT sector, 
Otherwise, uh, India may be taken over by China, that is what is being said. Can you? Yeah, sir, we'll get the comments later. Yes, please. please make your questions brief. Yeah, I'm Vinod Shinoy from Hindustan Petroleum. I would just uh, like to comment that while all of us cannot become leaders, talks like this and exposure to these concepts can help us when we see leaders acting in front of us, our company leaders, and we can play our own role as uh, somewhere down the hierarchy to give uh, mid-course directions and timely inputs to those leaders. I think that role also we could play. Of course. Sadhaju Patel from Yeah. Uh, my question is that uh, first of all we admire in Infosys and the leadership and the thinking. You are an organization which functions in multi location, different countries, obviously different cultures. What processes do you have or how do you ensure that the value systems and ethical thinking which is there in the leadership is percolates down to the younger people who are joining the organization? Well, two things. One is leadership by example. There is no substitute for leadership example unless the leaders of the company walk the talk and they're ethical and every small thing they do, they show the way. There's no way you can create an ethical organization. Because everybody knows what is happening, so that's very important. And it puts a great challenge on us, very, very tough. Second thing is an educational process. And educational process is very important because we run a very large training establishment in Mysore. About 20,000 people get trained. Many people cheat, they copy, and we ask them why. They said, sir, we copied in IIT. I said, you copied in IIT? Yeah. Don't think it's wrong? No. What do you do? And some of them give fake watches. Some of them give fake resumes. And we have a no tolerance, zero tolerance policy. So if you're caught copying, you go out. We give a fake watcher, no forgiveness. And if you, um, you know, give a wrong resume, you're out. And that is helping because we find that people doing it are very much less in our company than other companies. Because people reflect what society believes in. So unless society also changes, and society can change when the incentive structure is in favor of people who are honest and straightforward, and I think 95, 98% of our society is honest and straightforward, and they are held up as exemplars, we will not change behavior. So the other part of this is deterrent punishment to show people the stay in line. I think it works. So we've got to have both, the danda and the, and the sweet talk. Any lady, I mean, uh, doc, talk any lady because you know it's, it's very male dominated. <laughs> yes. Yes, sir. The only thing is we have people on the leadership issue getting the same things what the leaders have to do and what should be required. And one of them being that leaders have to develop further leaders. But then going by the private organization, many a times what you feel is that uh, the dictum is given to you that you have to do something. The responsibility is there and the accountability is there. But before that person is to take a decision on a particular issue, it comes from the top, it is imposed. And that gives you, I mean, it gives a cash 22 situation. You are supposed to do certain things which you don't do. And ultimately, then you get to have a feeling that there's no point for me to do if things have to move from top. So I will pretty well sit down. There's no point for me to do it. So I mean, you have that. You have to develop a leader. But then at times, you have to have a patience. I mean, what should be the approach from our side? Then? Because to tell the people from downside, uh, there's nothing to be disheartened about it, but you still continue with it. I mean, it's kind of a practical thing that you think. No, no, I, I understand the question. I think there are two things. One is to accept and do nothing and wait for the time. Are to quit. That's why, that's why, you see, it's extremely important we create a social structure where there are a lot of good jobs available. So people don't have to put up with all this. So if people are talented, people have opportunities, I think it, no, they've got obtained opportunities, they can go anywhere elsewhere, right? That is what will compel good action from corporate organizations. 
I think that's a very important thing. That means the ecosystem should be there. And now I think it's beginning to happen. And that will change behavior. Well, one mark of excellence is to keep time, and we all have to strive to do that. Uh, thanks so much to Mr. Mohandas Pai for embodying, I mean, he's an embodiment of entrepreneurial and leadership excellence in this country. And it is really a great privilege for all of us to listen to him inaugurating this uh, flagship course of the Institute. And I'm sure all the ideas and the inspiring vision which he gave us this morning will uh, continue to motivate us for the rest of the days to come in this week and understand the importance of this course, which is to create leadership excellence by having a vision that continues to motivate us and also to share and to listen to others. Uh, let me uh, request uh, uh, Dr. Kasturi Rankan to give uh, a gesture of vote of thanks to us, uh, thanks to Mr. Pai from all of the faculty of the Institute and all of you, the participants of the course. Thank you so much.